Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will talk about serving the LGBTQ plus community with guests, David Heistuman, CEO of the Sacramento LGBT Community Center, Nate Roten, Executive Director of One in Ten in Phoenix, and George Valencia, CEO of the Point Foundation in Los Angeles. So we've all come a long way uh, for LGBTQ plus rights recognition and acceptance, but we have a long way to go. So let's go around the room and, and could we have your take on the state of LGBTQ rights and acceptance? Uh, let's start with you, David. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so the state of the LGBTQ community right now, that in California, a lot of folks tend to think that it's all rainbows and unicorns out here, that we have a lot of LGBT uh, rights and, and privileges in California. But the reality is, is that while we do have a lot of legal equality, there is a severe lack of equity within our community, particularly with for um, folks in, in communities of color and those who have disabilities or other um, marginalizations that make it really difficult for them to sort of just go to school and access health, affirming health care um, or be treated well um, by law enforcement officers. And so there's a great distance between legal equality and true equity and, and in a, the experience of LGBTQ people living in California and Sacramento in particular. And so we have quite a bit of distance to, to, to close there. It's such a great point, this whole idea of stacked inequality, that inequality stacks on inequality, disparity stacks on, on disparity. Uh, Nate, how do you see this uh, from where you sit in, in Phoenix? You know, you've got a, a really interesting uh, state in which the center of gravity is in Maricopa County. So Phoenix, Scottsdale, uh, Tucson, and, and you have this incredible concentration, but you also have different cultures throughout uh, um, Arizona. Where, how do you see the state of affairs uh, in Arizona and in Maricopa County? Mark, it's been a really interesting, I would say 24 months. Um, you know, you had the pandemic in there and it makes it even more interesting, but from a political standpoint, because of Arizona's tremendous growth rates, we have seen fairly, I guess I would call them wild swings in our political uh, persuasions here in the state. So formerly a solidly red state. We've elected more um, Democrat uh, and, and progressive leaders to statewide office in the last um, 12 months than historically in the last 40. Uh, it, and it really underscores some of the changing demographics here. We also have seen a change in um, the makeup, uh, the quote unquote Browning of America is happening here in Arizona, um, I would say first uh, amongst most states. And what what I what what that does for me is it makes me really hopeful for Arizona. We continue to uh, here in our state fight for a fight uh, fight for a ban on conversion therapy, for instance, for minors, which has been made illegal in every state around us, including Utah. So that just gives you a, a, you know an example from an LGBTQ perspective of what we're seeing. And then the thing that's really interesting about our community that I think is very special is the intersectionality, where when we have um, the murder of George Floyd, um, when we have attacks on other um, demographics that for us at one in 10, being an LGBTQ youth serving agency, uh, at first appearance, it may some may think, why would that impact us? But it does, because every single demographic is a part of our community. So if we don't make it part of our fight and our cause, then we are missing supporting uh, a, a re really significant sector of the youth population that we serve. And George, you're also a youth serving organization. How does this unfold in, in your neck of the woods uh, over in Los Angeles? Well, we support, and thank you, Mark, again, for including me. Uh, we support young people across the nation, and we're actually right in the middle of our scholar selections process. Every year, I would say probably for the last eight to 10 years, we get over 2,000 applications for probably 20 to 25 spots. It's very competitive. But you hear firsthand what these young people across the country and the world because we support individuals that are from other countries that will be studying in the United States. So you, we get a good sense of what's happening. And, and I couldn't agree more that, you know, what's happened 
the last few years and certainly in the last year has impacted definitely our students of color more than, than anybody else, I would say, whether it was COVID, what um, the reckoning that we had as a country and as a world on race. And so, you know, there's still a lot to be done. And it makes me proud that part of our mission, of course, is to include leadership training and to make sure that we select scholars that are studying in every field possible. But there's there's still a long way to go in, in many places and certainly in places possible. Could you just describe, uh, George, uh, the programs and the extent of, of your outreach? Because I think it's enormously interesting. Um, what you're also doing is you're connecting dots uh, amongst people. It's, it's sort of, if you take a look at what we're experiencing in terms of the pandemic, there is this idea that until the pandemic is cured for the world, right, it cannot be cured because there are vectors of transmission uh, here that can affect us all. But there are also vectors of transmission of ignorance, of hate, of disparity. And part of this idea of, of equipping people with knowledge and education is to basically position them to cure those vectors of transmission of hate and, and, and disparity. Uh, talk a little bit about your programs. Yeah, thank you. We, we have, uh, of course, our priority here is making sure that young people have access to education and that higher education. And so we support individuals that are in undergraduate and graduate programs. A few years ago, we launched a community college program. We support individuals that are in their final year of community college. Last year, we launched a two-year community college program. We also give out $1,000 scholarship uh, grants as well, a one-time grant. And earlier this year, we launched, I guess at the end of last year, we started the process and announced a class of our first BIPOC scholarship recipients. And so when you look at COVID and the way it's impacted I and mean, systemic racism in education, we knew we needed to step up and do even more. Very proud of the fact that before our BIPOC program, 71% of our scholars identify as people of color, but we knew we needed to do more. So as an example, our BIPOC scholarship program does not limit the applicant to going full-time to school because we understand that that in itself is a privilege. And so we support part-time students as well. We do not require a GPA, but rather a commitment to education and proof of enrollment. Because in some communities, they don't have access to get education or the educators that are required to even succeed in a four-year institution. So we're very proud of that we had uh, some great support from that from individuals like Katy Perry, you know, and uh, so, so that helped interest, create interest among young people. We had Wells Fargo interested in that as well, and, um, and a few other folks that really made that launch possible. And part of the scholarship, every scholarship, includes a level of mentoring or coaching. It includes leadership training as well, because we want to make sure that these young people go back to their communities and really lift them up. And David, um, in, initially, um, so many of the organizations like you, community centers, were really about safe space, mm -hmm. right? Safe space. It was a place where people could go and just sort of be themselves, express themselves, but also feel relaxed in an environment. But your programs have evolved over the years, haven't they? Have you also received the kind of uh, support that George is indicating that he is receiving from uh, community members across uh, Sacramento? You know, there is a lot of support for the LGBTQ community in our community and, and certainly throughout California as we've gained more legal rights and there's been more understanding of the community and, and um, engagement and sort of visibility in popular culture. I think that that's less true maybe for the trans community and certainly for um, some of the other more marginalized parts of the LGBTQ community. But yeah, the center, you know, was founded in 1978 as a, a place where people could, could get some direct assistance, but really have a safe place to be and to find community with other folks like themselves. And over time, we have evolved to be an organization that whose mission is to create a region where LGBTQ people thrive, where they're not just safe and welcome, but they're really able to find the health and wellness support that they need 
um, to be able to, to advocate for more uh, inclusive policy, public policy in workplaces and schools and medical environments. Um, and then also to still find that community, that, send, that safe space, that place where people are affirmed, whether they are young or old and can find one, find folks like themselves um, and really have that sense of, of shared experience and, and shared family that they might not have found at home. And uh, and Nate, uh, your your um, way of of um, of expressing this really is uh, through your programs. Could you talk a little bit about your programs? And we just completed a um, a survey, a very interesting results. We asked what are the greatest needs among members of the LGBTQ plus uh, community, and we found uh, sixty four percent said safe spaces uh, where people can share information, and then we also uh, found specific physical and mental health support as well as counseling and tactical support in dealing with society's dysfunction surrounding acceptance of LGBTQ plus individuals. How does that, um, that kind of um, idea, those ideas um, unfold within uh, one in 10? And thank you for that, Mark. I, one, one thing I, I like to bring up, and, and this is not making light of this topic uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but one thing that we have to remember is one of the top issues facing uh, young LGBTQ youth is very similar to most youth or most teens, and that is probably acne. <laughs> now, I mentioned that because they, teenage years are difficult. It, it's, it's, it's really a hard time. And all of those same issues are affecting our youth. But then you add on top of that, you layer in the issues um, that affect LGBT youth specifically, particularly our trans and BIPOC youth. And it, it creates a, a very different scenario where we have to expand our support and, and our services um, much greater than maybe some of our straight allied organizations would have to. So at one in 10, we've opened 10 satellites across the state. We were on track to have 15 by the end of 2020. Obviously the pandemic uh, put a pause on that as we rolled into virtual programming. But as we looked at our end of year data and survey that we do every year, this year we found that 54% of the youth that we served um, experienced suicidal ideations, attempts, and self-harm. Uh, for me, this is a stat that not only can it not be ignored, but it's, it's as, as we talk about pandemics that are affecting our country, this is one of them. And so at one in 10, like many of our um, other agencies across this country, um, we're employing services like our evidence-based intervention model of sources of strength and others um, to really deal with this head on. Um, it's something that we find at one in 10, um, we is, is an absolute necessity for our young people that we serve. In addition, we have a summer camp that operates usually every summer, um, serving three to 500 unduplicated youth a year, ages 11 to 24. This year it had to be, in 2020, it had to be virtual. Um, it was still very successful, but you really alter the support and the sense of community that youth are finding with one another um, when it's in a virtual setting. There's still a lot of magic that happens there, but I'm very excited to get back to in person where the true magic of one in 10 programs is our youth themselves and how they are there to support one another. You know, again, you're raising this this really important point of trauma on top of, of trauma. Um, I'd, I'd also like to remind our viewers, um, anybody who has any questions, please submit them to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll try and get to them. But this whole idea of trauma on top of trauma, we're in a tra traumatic period of time. Um, we also have had um, the, this, this real division in American society uh, amongst uh, blue state and red state, blue, blue and red. Um, as it were, uh, perspectives. Uh, we have the pandemic, we have acne, uh, as, as you point out, uh, Nate. How do we shift our services to take into account some of the modern challenges that we, that we face? We've talked about the idea of providing um, uh, additional support for, um, for um, youth of color, um, and uh, trying to be more appropriate over time. Uh, before the show started, uh, David and I had an interesting discussion about uh, the whole idea of names, right? How do you place, um, how do you make sure that, that you're honoring through mention 
of, of different groups. Uh, David, could you just uh, sort of reprise a little bit the, the history of the naming of the LGBTQ uh, or the LGBT uh, center? Um, and, and let's talk about making sure that, that we're actually talking openly um, and recognizing uh, different groups and, and exploring uh, the sensibilities surrounding this. Talk a little bit about the, the history of names of, of your organization. Sure. The, the center was originally founded as the Lambda Community Fund and then the Lambda Community Center when we got a, a space. And at some point um, in the, the early 90s, the organization's board changed the name to the Sacramento Gay and Lesbian Center serving Sacramento's LGBTQ community. And um, but the reality is, is that that wasn't that wasn't as inclusive of our entire community, just with gay and lesbian in the name of the organization. Um, and sort of also represents the, the dominance that maybe those parts of the community had in, in controlling some of the more su the support structures uh, and organizations in communities across the country. And so over time, the organization, um, when I first came to, to the center, we changed the name to the LGBT Center. And um, the reality, though, is that, that that probably is not as inclusive as it should be either. And so today we talk more about the queer and trans community with sort of more umbrella terms that are inclusive of, of all of the sexual orientation and gender identity uh, groups. However, the language does evolve over time in our understanding of these communities and their needs and the, the ways that they personally identify um, change over time as well. And so different parts of the country sort of have different initialism, but um, what we try to do now is to honor everyone's identity for whatever they see it to be, whatever they feel it to be. And um, so that means that language has to change and our understanding of those sort of subgroups has to change as well. What do you all think is, is the most important factor in creating acceptance? We just completed a poll in which uh, we asked what factors have the strongest impact on broad public acceptance of LGBTQ plus equality. And the, the area that got the, uh, the most votes was individual members of the LGBTQ plus community being publicly and naturally out, open and transparent about who they are, followed by laws uh, enacted. Um, Nate, how do you see that, that um, idea of just being the, the day when, <laughs> <laughs> when everybody can just be. Um, how, what do you see as the, the major driver here? One of the, the top questions that I get from people outside of our immediate community is, uh, what is this, you know, quote unquote fad with um, new pronouns? And what's the importance of that? And, and why, you know, why is this happening now? And my response to that, and I think, uh, you know, those working in this space would agree is, this is not new. These uh, identities, pronouns, labels, etc., have always been there. It's just that now we have the correct and, and ever emerging language to uh, coordinate or identify with those communities. And it's allowing people to, rather than select boxes of LGB, to select boxes that really identify with who they are. And our youth every year, again, with our end of year survey data, we as staff at one in 10 are, are further educated about emerging labels and identities that, that frankly are even new to us. And rather than focus on, on how many there are or um, the reason that they are emerging now, I think it's more important to look at the community that is forming around these various labels and pronouns and how that is supporting these folks in becoming the best person that they can be within that community that truly reflects who they are. And the magic of that is palpable, both in, in um, you know, talking to these youth, but also in the data and the reduction in things like self-harm and uh, the increase in self-esteem and belonging, all things that again, teens battle with, that we as Americans battle with that if we can help our young people to be the best that they can be and to not feel alone, um, that's, that's a game changer. George, do you see that there is a, a generational uh, shift since you deal so often with young people who I'm sure are informing you about their sensibilities? Do you feel that, that people who are coming up in this society where there is greater acceptance, there is uh, more relaxed uh, um, discussion within media environments. 
and there's a more uh, diverse set of perspectives that are being shared amongst us. Uh, do you find that, that the younger people are coming to this uh, whole set of issues with different um, attitudes? No, 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 I'm kidding. Um, yes, absolutely. Every, every year that we get applications, to Nate's point, you know, we're being educated on how people want to be, uh, how they want to be identified, how they identify themselves. And I kid you not, we, we get together as a board and we go through training every single year to make sure that we're understanding. You know, I, I found it interesting a number of years ago because obviously all of us here have our constituents and part of our constituents are also our donors that we have to uh, deal with and those don't always match up. You know, when we added Q to LGBT on our website, the number of individuals, donors that came and said, I will not support you because they found the Q for queer very offensive. They grew up at a time when that was just a horrible thing. I remember that, you know? And once it was explained to one particular donor, they were so happy to understand it and start seeing it more in various organizational uses that uh, they've become... A, an even bigger supporter of the organization. But yes, I, I do see a difference. You know, I, I found it interesting that for a generation that didn't like labels, I kept seeing more. And so it does require a lot of, as Nate was saying, creating a space where people can be themselves and educate us, educate ourselves along the way on what these terms are. But I, um, I find it invigorating, I, I really do. When I see individuals that are my age or older in a meeting with young people begin by, you know, providing their pronouns, you know, that like that I never thought would happen, you know, and so that gives people already a level of comfort in a room in that you acknowledge that, so. I think it's interesting that 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 we're constantly educating ourselves right as Americans we're trying to share information so I'd like to I'd like to close this because we're coming to the end of our time I'd like to close this discussion with a with a very um, important and difficult topic change needs to happen where change hasn't happened yet right there are still a lot of people who have real concerns. Some of, the, some of it's based in their, their faith, their religious uh, beliefs and teachings. Some of it's based on traditional outlook. Uh, some of it's based on their own view of the world. How do you um, interact with people who are not yet there um, and who are opposers to the idea of LGBTQ plus uh, rights, normalization, the, 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 the acceptance that every individual on earth, earth uh, craves. Uh, George, could you give a cut at that? Um, because the fact is, is that if we're only talking to people who already are there, we're kind of, in a sense, wasting our time, not entirely, but do, do you see what I'm saying? How do you deal with that? Well, I, I think nothing speaks louder than personal experience. I grew up Mormon. I'm first generation Latino from Texas. So for a lot of people, that's a lot of, you know, strikes against you. And I actually welcome the opportunity. That is something that we are working with our scholars to make sure that they can sit in a space and not feel disrespected, but also make sure that that they are listening to what another individual is saying and engage in dialogue as much as possible. It's difficult. I, you know, there are some people that will at least sit down and be open to a conversation. And there are times when you just have to walk away and revisit it another time. But I, I wish I had an answer for that. All I can say is that I think it's very important. And I think trying to find a common Commonality in the person or people that you're speaking with is a first start, yes, first step. 
David, um, let, let's go to you and Nate. Nate, you'll you'll take us out. Uh, how do you deal with with uh, people who really come from a different place and and really are not there? Um, how, how do you see that? You know, I see it as is an opportunity to have a discussion to talk about pe our personal experiences, just like George was saying. Um, and the reality is, is there were a lot more of those people uh, just a few years ago who didn't understand, they never heard of this. What is this whole trans business? Why do they need? Why do you need marriage equality? All these different things. And you know what we've seen in our community and, and across the country and across the world is that even though we have more uh, visibility in popular culture, and even though we have legal rights. In, in our communities, the cultural change that's necessary takes time and that takes longer than any law that could be passed. And so, you know, in our we operate housing programs for LGBTQ youth and the number one reason that youth experiencing home experience homelessness and, and, and are in that situation is because of the rejection of family and those close in their community where they don't have those supports. We have so, uh, health and wellness programs that center around sexual health, gender health, and um, mental health, because in the, the standard or, or the sort of traditional health systems, finding a provider that understands the issues and barriers that you, that you experience as an LGBTQ person is extremely difficult, even though there's legal equality, even though insurance carriers are required to provide that coverage and care, even though like you can see you know, uh, a television docudrama or, or, or medical show that includes LGBTQ characters, the experience of people sort of walking and living in our community or um, going to school, you know, over 80% of students, uh, LGBTQ students still experience bullying and harassment, even though there, there's a lot of um, sort of support for them and a lot more teachers and, and school personnel that understand and support those students. So these, the cultural change that's necessary uh, is sort of an ongoing, uh, ongoing process. And we need to continue to, to help increase understanding in any possible way that we can by having as many of those conversations with those in our immediate friends and family circles, but also with, with broader community and trying to get folks who don't agree with you or don't understand to sit down and have a conversation about what their experience is and what your experience is and find ways that um, we can increase that, uh, that understanding and acceptance and affirmation of one another. I think that's so important. The idea of respectful dialogue amongst people who disagree, can't we use a lot more of that, right? And, and particularly when you're talking as a, with somebody who's anti-Semitic when you're Jewish, or somebody who is racist when you're Black or uh, Latin Hispanic, right? How do, you, how do you have that dialogue? I think that's so important. We got a, a uh, a question, um, which I think really sums it up, who creates the labels, right? And it really does depend on where you're coming from. Does it come from somebody who opposes or somebody who accepts, right? Um, Nate, how do you see uh, engaging in these dialogues and particularly dialogues around things like uh, labels, who creates the labels and, and how do we define rights and, and those kinds of issues, Nate? Well, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with David, and and so we also invest heavily in those types of programs. I think in direct answer to your question, there, Mark, um, is that for those of us that were that are in our forties and beyond, we remember the fight for marriage equality, don't ask, don't tell, the AIDS crisis, et cetera. And the answer there was to continue to come out and change hearts and minds with individual stories. And I know here in Arizona, we've had. Uh, we've been investing in, in government relations at one in 10 for the last three years. And the, the conversations that we're able to have with some of our even most uh, conservative elected officials um, have been really um, heartening to me um, because you'll be in a meeting with someone and, and George, I too um, grew up Mormon um, and many of our elected officials here in Arizona are Mormon um, or, or, you know, very religiously affiliated. And, um, connecting with them on those, on those values and then sharing with them these personal stories and, and again, connecting from that, that those shared values really does change hearts and minds. And that's how we have to continue to go about this because the more that, that someone, that, that Americans can identify that they know someone personally that is trans, that is, um, you know, a close uh, BIPOC friend that, that they can, um, they'll never fully understand the, the struggles, 
but they can start to change their own perception of what that individual is facing on a daily basis. And that is where we start to change America as a whole. I think that, that that's, that that's such a, a, an observant uh, point, uh, Nate, that um, it starts with dialogue, but it also continues with sharing and empathy, right? You don't have to agree to empathize, right? It really does start with trying to place yourself in somebody else's shoes and, and hearing, right, George? I mean, that whole idea of, of younger generations and older generations informing each other uh, people of different perspectives informing each other and then dealing with each other. Absolutely. So, so thank you all for sharing. This has just been a wonderful discussion of uh, to be continued on a daily basis forever and ever. Uh, and thank you all uh, who have attended and, and contributed questions for, uh, for asking them. They were just a big help. Uh, everybody stay safe. That's the nonprofit report. We'll see you again on Tuesday. And, and thank you all panelists for sharing your experiences and the experience of your organization. Thank your board members, thank your staff and everybody stay safe from COVID, okay? <laughs> <laughs>